When Portal came out in 2007, it was almost immediately hailed as one of the best games ever made. Its gameplay was something that the world had never seen before, its story was funny and experimental and meta in a way that video games were only just starting to scratch. It was built around a fantastic vocal performance, a memorable song, and it just had so much going for it. At the time it came out, I was going to community college, and almost immediately the thing that the nerds in the student lounge and an anime club were talking about wasn't the continuation of the Half-Life saga or the successor to a beloved multiplayer mod, but the fact that this little portal game had so much surprising story and heart. Based on the trailers, I had expected something akin to The Incredible Machine or Lemmings, a simple series of puzzle rooms you select from a menu with an ambient techno soundtrack playing as you solve them and some funny congratulatory lines when you finished each level. So when it turned out to be this surprising narrative about super science run amok, with a sinister edge, we were totally caught off guard. You have to remember this was 2007. Video games being meta and playing with the conventions of the medium wasn't ground that had really been trodden before. Bioshock had come out two months before that and its would you kindly twist was still rattling in people's heads, but before that you have to go all the way back to 2001 when Metal Gear Solid 2 introduced an entire generation of nerds to the concept of memes for the first time. Did you say nerd? But one thing people overlook about Portal is that it had the gift of being freed from expectations. Normally a new game has to convince audiences that it's worth buying and paying attention to, but Portal came bundled with two of the most anticipated games of the year and they did all the heavy lifting for it. Portal could keep its secrets, hold its cards close to its chest, and when people played the game, they didn't feel the expectation of the game having to be worth a certain purchase price or last a certain length. It was just some cool freebie, so people accepted it for what it was. It's really easy to imagine a world where Portal had squandered this gift and right up front been like, ooh, you won't believe how cool the Twisted Portal is, or we got the guys from Old Man Murray working for us and they're cooking up a story that's really gonna knock your socks off, wink, or released Still Alive ahead of the game to promote it and just totally spoiled everything. I bring this up because one of the ultimate paradoxes of criticism is how our expectations affect our enjoyment of things. If you praise a piece of media, people will go into it with higher expectations and judge it more harshly. If you've ever seen the movie Ratatouille, my attitude towards criticism is very similar to what uh, the film posits in its ending, that one of the best and most important things a critic can do is draw attention to the new and the overlooked, to help art find its audience and get the recognition it deserves, and help creators be rewarded and validated for doing good work so they'll keep doing it. It's fun and entertaining to dunk on bad games and movies and point out overused tropes or the creator's recurring issues and hangups, but ultimately finding the good in the world and sharing it with people who might not have the time and energy and inclination to go sorting through all the crap is one of the most valuable things we can do, especially in this moment of time when our content delivery platforms are being overwhelmed with crap and shuffling us into our little algorithmically generated boxes of what it thinks we'll like. This video is going to be focusing on a 2013 indie game called Mayhem Triple, and I brought up this paradox of expectation because I could totally see how if I were to talk a bunch of sugar about this game, it might make people go into it expecting too much and subsequently ruin their enjoyment of the game. A big part of modern internet discourse in general, and media criticism in particular, is the need to hype things up. It's why whenever you look at videos here on YouTube, it's always people making declarations about something being either the best ever or the worst ever, uh, declaring something overrated or underrated. As a relatively new critic, I want to try and avoid this hyper machine that threshes any nuance or subjectivity, and I want to help you be better about navigating it. This is a game that I think is good and worth playing, and the fact that it currently sits with only 22 reviews on Steam is frankly incredibly depressing, because the person who made it did good work and deserves more recognition and encouragement to keep creating. It's not the kind of game that would normally invite in-depth analysis and discussion, because it's an hour-long run-and-gun platformer that tells jokes and sets up cool set pieces, and I want to talk about it because there's a lot to admire, but at the same time I feel like spoiling everything that happens in the game would take away some enjoyment of it. But I also recognize that a lot of people watch these video deep dives as an alternative to actually playing games, or to see someone else's insights about a game as a whole, and I want to give those people the entirety of the game and why I like it. So if you're willing to go on my word alone, you should totally uh, follow the link in the video description to play it now, and then come back and finish the review when you're done. It's free on itch.io, and if you want to support the creator, there's a $5 version on Steam with achievements and controller support. Uh, if you need more convincing, I'm going to give a relatively brief review of the game that highlights its strengths after this, but avoids major spoilers. And if you don't care about playing and just want to hear me talk through the game, then after that will be my full spoiler-filled in-depth discussion where I go through the game moment by moment and talk about what I like about it. Also, just a heads up, I'm not going to be reading the dialogue from the game out loud, so if you're just listening to the audio, you might want to pull the video part up so you don't miss out on the many jokes that the game is going to be showing you. Maybe in future videos I'll try reading the audio aloud if there's a demand for it or I think it fits, but for Mayhem Triple, the text has such strong comic timing, I feel like letting it stand on its own. 
Mayhem Triple is a game that I installed and played on a lazy fall afternoon in 2016. I don't even know how I got the game. Maybe I won it in some giveaway on Steam Gifts or was it a bundle I bought? Regardless, I was going through my giant backlog of games I had acquired over the years on Steam and installing them, uh, giving a few minutes to win me over and then hiding them if they didn't. And compared to the usual slate of bundle trash and game-shaped objects that I've been trawling through, Mayhem Triple immediately stood out to me, and I wound up playing through the entire game in a single sitting. The game's developer, Dustin Gunn, describes it as, uh, quote, a cinematic platformer focusing on exciting set pieces and violent, fast gunplay, and he is absolutely right. Every moment of this game feels authored and directed in a way that shows a lot of care was put into what was being conveyed. Doing the research, this game is called Mayhem Triple because Mayhem was a game he made all the way back in 2003. It which had a sequel called Mayhem 2, and frankly it's hugely inspiring seeing the amount of progress from those to this, and the amount of dedication to finally nailing what must have started as a silly and juvenile premise. After some brief intuitive tutorializing which you're introduced to the responsive weighty parkour and dodging mechanics, and the satisfying loud guns, you're in for a non-stop thrill ride of action set pieces and show a lot of love and care put into them. Every time you see an area off the beaten path, you're able to reach it and be rewarded with a secret cache or hidden weapon. You rarely go more than a screen or two before encountering some new wrinkle in the gameplay, and while there are a couple of difficult bottlenecks, the checkpointing is usually very generous, and you get thrown back into the fray almost immediately. There are over 20 weapons, most of them are fun and creative, like a gun that shoots bear traps, or a stake launcher that pins enemies to walls, or a flying saw blade that you can control directly, and the story is funny, mixing some killer one-liners with gentle absurdism. I did a playthrough with my partner watching, and there were plenty of times we were both just cracking up at the events unfolding on screen. It's a total recommend. The creator even released a map editor and Steam Workshop support to create your own level and campaigns, and nobody released anything for it. Nothing. The video showing how to use the level editor has 82 views. That's fewer views than my videos. It's depressing. This game rules. Play it. The first thing you see when the title screen loads up is Miguel Mig Carter's One Room House. And as someone who loves to make fun of the grandpa's bed in Stardew Valley, I have to say, this is a great room. Straight out of male living spaces, we've got a folding cot, cardboard box for a table, eating beans right out of the can, bare walls, and an old CRT on a trolley. Oh yeah, and guns. Right away you know exactly what kind of protagonist Mig Carter is, and it rules. Also, in keeping with the cavalcade of gags, right away the main menu is labeled Le Menu. When you make a choice, it switches to the Sub Menu. Well, bon appetit! When you start the game, Mig's journey begins the way many video game protagonists does, with a flash of light and a loud crash waking him up in the middle of the night. Unlike Ness sitting off into the night with a cracked bat and his loyal dog in tow, Mig doesn't even have to leave his bed without his dual pistols falling into his hands like a badass. As soon as you leave his house, you'll find yourself doing jumps and flips and dodge rolls and wall jumps as you acclimate yourself to the controls, because this is a game where it feels fun to move around. Mig has a nice weightiness to his movements, your jumps and wall jumps are easy to read with animation transitions that are quick and snappy, and your gunshots are good and loud. And you have infinite ammo with no reloading, which adds a lot to the feeling of this just being a non-stop thrill ride. Your first encounter is with a mysterious time traveler materializing out of thin air and pledging that it's up to him to avert the upcoming crisis. Uh-oh, looks like this time traveler is out of time. Haha, <laughs> blam. Luckily, he's still got enough breath left in his body to warn you that there's an invasion of giant bunnies from the future on the way and will destroy everything unless he can stop them. Anyways, Mig continues heading to the right, as all good 2D game protagonists do. After picking up a radio and going through a brief stint with some fourth wall breaking tutorializing, the bunny invasion arrives and we're on our way. I love the bunnies as cannon fodder enemies, and the game gets a lot of use out of them. They can use almost every weapon in the game, so even at the end they still pose a threat, and their strength in numbers means crowd control and being over your surroundings are always important, because all it takes is one stray bunny picking a gun up off of its fallen comrade to blow you away when your guard is down. Also, they're pretty cute little bum buns. Aww. Now that Mig is dealing with armed enemies, the dodge roll will becomes a vital part of surviving the bunny onslaught. In general, I'm not the biggest fan of giving the player a dodge roll with invincibility frames as a substitute for making attacks you can actually dodge, but given the game's hectic pace, it's a totally understandable compromise. And you'll need it, because you start the game with only 4 hit points, and even when you upgrade your health, it's still incredibly easy to die if you aren't paying attention. Speaking of upgrading your health, this is when you run into Hector Graves' Esquire, who is pretty chill about the impending end of the world, all things considered. Which is good, because he acts as your weapon dealer and source of upgrades throughout the game. You get money from killing enemies and hidden in little secret caches throughout the levels, and you can use it to buy upgrades to your health and how many weapons you can carry. You can also buy new weapons, but almost all the weapons normally available for you to purchase are also hidden throughout the game in ways that reward exploration. If you see a ledge just out of reach or a narrow crack in a wall, you can usually figure out a way to reach it and will almost always find some kind of reward inside. Entering your first new area is as good a time as any to mention how good the soundtrack is. It's 
by Arthur Lee, uh, an indie game developer who's better known by their handle of Mr. Padunkian. I mostly know him as the developer of a Fallout parody game with one of the most infuriating game mechanics I've ever encountered, but I gotta give him credit as a musician because the music in this game rules. Every new area has a new gimmick, and in House of Cards, level geometry is frequently crumbling around you. There's this cool little wiggly effect when you're walking on a floor that has the ability to collapse. The game first uses it to signal when you're about to fall into a pit full of enemies, or when you need to dodge to avoid falling debris, but eventually use it to your own advantage by climbing to the top of the map and then crashing down through a weakened floor to enter a new area. Just really solid level design. Also, throughout the level, you get little glimpses of the boss that's waiting for you at the end. I love it when game developers put in the effort to build up a boss like this and give you a sneak peek of what's to come. The first boss is pretty simple on its own. Run from the giant bunny and shoot it until it dies. But it still finds a couple ways to spice up the battle. You can shoot broken pillars to poke the bunny in the eye for extra damage. If you, and if you go on long enough without killing the rabbit, then he just runs out of space and accidentally decapitates himself at the end of the level. Just really solidly designed and paced. I wish more games would have a mechanic to count boss battles a win if you just stay alive long enough like this. The general purpose of bosses and games is supposed to be to test your mastery of the gameplay systems and provide a change of pace. And in both instances, I feel like it's preferable to have some some sort of uh, out where the game goes, okay, close enough, and moves on, instead of continuing to make you slam into that boss over and over. Anyways, you continue on with more parkour, more dead bunnies, and oh look, a cleverly hidden weapon cache. This is the Brutalizer, a taser that turns bunnies to a crisp with a satisfying crack, and has some interesting physics on where the electrode goes when you fire it. Which is perfect, because now you're in an area where all the ceilingless damage in a stray bullet can send a segment crashing to the ground. You can be strategic and try and crush the bunnies under it, or shoot it all ahead of you so it can't be used against you, or just ignore it and run past and hope for the best. See a little crack on the ceiling there? Yeah, with some careful timing, you can jump up there. And now you've got another cool weapon, the saw wire. It's a gun that shoots a flying blade that you can control and it lasts until it crashes into a wall or a floor. So if you get skilled with it, you can run through whole swarms of bunnies like a blender. Quick mention, uh, at this point I hadn't bought any weapon carrying upgrades, so I'm stuck with the starting limit of two guns. But once you get a few upgrades in, you'll be able to carry an arsenal of both the fun silly guns and the really practical lethal ones. Next section is you dodging and climbing out of collapsing Tetrids straight out of that one level in Yoshi's Island. And once you're past that, congratulations! You're about a quarter of the way through the game now. Like I said earlier, this is a game where your first playthrough would take about an hour and change, so it's all killer, no filler. As an aside, I went to howlongtobeat.com just to double check the game's length, and literally nobody else has entered anything for the game there. God, it's just so depressing when a cool indie game like this has zero footprint online. Continuing with the theme of building up bosses before you fight them, the first thing you see when you enter this next area is a helicopter raining hot death on bunnies, with some help from what I have to assume is one of the developer's friends. You're introduced to a new enemy type, uh, the mutant bunnies, and these guys can definitely wreck you if you're not careful. They're especially tough when you're fighting them along with a bunch of regular bunnies, not just because they have more health and hit harder and are more aggressive, but because since they're so big, they tend to get in the way of all your bullets and make crowd control that much harder. You seemingly get trapped between two walls that are too tall to climb, but luckily here comes another addition to Mig's growing support network, the only female character in the game. She makes sure you understand the timeless gaming cliché of crack blocks that can be blown up with an explosive weapon, and then flies away with some words of encouragement and a plan to go after the mothership to try and stop the invasion. One screen full of dead bunnies later, we run into Hector Graves again, and he has a special task for us. A member of his organization has been taken hostage, and the only way to kill the bunny without it killing the hostage is a bank grenade throw. This hostage rescue mini game pops up a couple more times throughout the game, and it's probably my least favorite thing about it. It's really hard to judge the trajectory of throwing grenades because there's no indicator of the arc they'll travel in when you throw them. You can only carry one explosive at a time, and the rocket launcher is so much more common and used so much more frequently that it's not really worth it to try and juggle a grenade throughout the game. They're not all signposted well, so it's very easy to be running and shooting and unknowingly kill the hostage the moment they appear on screen. And unfortunately, there's an entire upgrade system that uses the key's hostages drop when you rescue them, so it really feels like you're missing out when you fail to save one. I feel like a really easy fix would have been to spawn a grenade before each hostage rescue to signpost that it was coming and also make the player got at least one chance at it. Oh well, anyways. Continuing on from that, this next part is probably the low point of the game. You have a long stretch between checkpoints where you enter a screen, fight off several waves of rabbits until a rabbit with a rocket launcher appears, grab the rocket launcher, blow up at some crack rocks, then move on to the next screen and repeat. It's a real meat grinder. I died about a dozen times before I finally made it through, and looking at my recordings, it took 15 minutes to get past this part, which is a real speed bump in a game this short. It's especially strange because this is right after you get to buy a fresh round of upgrades and weapons, so you should be more powerful than you've ever been, but this is the toughest 
as the game ever feels. It even looks boring because it's using the same graphics that the previous part used. I guess it speaks to the game's quality that I was willing to soldier through that part when I'm usually someone who loses interest when I have to replay the same few minutes of a game over and over. Also, there's this running gag where every time Mig responds, he does a mangled version of an action movie one-liner, and they're all really funny, so that helps a little. Anyways, with lots of dodge rolling and a little luck, you'll finally make it through and witness one of the helicopters from earlier get hijacked by a particularly brave bunny, with you helpless to stop it. The next screen, you'll once again be unable to prevent an act of violence, this time a civilian being blown up by a penis-shaped drone that drops testicle-shaped bombs. This is the third and final regular enemy that you'll be encountering throughout the game, and I could see some people not being into it, but heck, I'm not above laughing at weird penis-shaped objects. And there's also an added level to the joke where it's actually just a fighting game by saying that the rabbits have an immature sense of humor. Giving you a few one-on-one -on -one penis drones to get your bearings, you get one final broken block obstacle puzzle, where this time you have to burrow through a huge stack of them with some inadvertent help from those testicle bombs, as well as your trusty rocket launcher. Thank goodness this is the last time we'll see that particular type of cracked block puzzle. The game can only go up from here. The eyepatch bunny leader makes his first appearance to taunt you, and then that rabbit hijacked helicopter from earlier appears to chase you down. You're supposed to avoid its attacks and blast your way through obstacles until you reach an area at the end with an infinitely respawning rocket launcher, but if you're sneaky and a little lucky, you can take it out early by maneuvering so it blows itself up with its own heat-seeking missile. Variety! It's a good thing in games. With the helicopter disposed of, we arrive at the Bunny Mothership as it lands. This is your last opportunity to make purchases from Hector Graves before heading on to the final act of the game, so take advantage of that. After making your purchases, in this case the At Stake, a powerful but slow gun that shoots wooden stakes that impale bunnies on walls, you enter the Mothership and immediately begin carving your way through the bunny horde on their home turf. The gimmick of this area is that the bunnies have cannons that launch little walking bombs that you can explode by shooting or smack with your melee weapon to give them a little air time. The very first time you encounter one, you have to use it to blow up yet another set of cracked blocks, but immediately afterward you encounter the second and much more useful function of those bombs. They can electrify and power up terminals, which in turn will allow you to activate different functions of the mothership. This compounds really well with having to guide the bombs across areas, since you'll be juggling them between floors and tractor beams and there's an unlimited supply, so if you mess up you can always just run back to the cannon and spawn another. Now it's time to beat the Alpha Bunny, the classic type of boss fight where the boss can't be killed, and you have to avoid them and incapacitate them as you make your way through an obstacle course, until you finally find the one thing that can kill them. Not really anything more to add than that, this is an exciting test of your skills leading into the endgame, and also it has a really gnarly custom death animation when you get killed by it. Ugh. The final chapter, The Fall of Mig Carter, begins with a rare quiet moment to catch your breath as the funny mothership launches into space. But then it's right back to killing. You have a tricky segment where you have to use your melee attack to jump a bomb across a bunch of floating platforms, so you can power up a switch at the end and then levitate through an obstacle course of insta-death laser beams. This can be a little frustrating as you get the timing right, but looking back over my playthrough it only took about 3 minutes to get through. It's just a testament to how frantic the rest of the game is that that stood out. There's a comically oversized bubble machine that exists entirely just to justify how Mig can breathe in space for this next part. It's very silly, and I love it. You get another empty, peaceful room with a view that almost immediately gets ruined when an asteroid comes crashing through the window. Oh yeah, and this game's still adding new stuff all the way up to the end, so now there are zero gravity segments. Mig stays stuck to the floor, but when you press the jump button now he kicks off and goes flying until he hits an obstacle. You're going to have a few excellent deaths here, especially when pressing the A button to dismiss the dialogue when he responds also makes him go flying off into the ether. But to be fair, it's really funny. Also, you're going to be dealing with asteroids that break apart into smaller pieces when you shoot them. Just like, uh, asteroids. They even have one of those bomb puzzles in Zero-G, and after the previous escort mission with one, it feels good to just use your guns to blast them and send them flying into targets. Finally, you've reached the leader of the giant space bunnies. But just in case you thought fighting one last bunny would be easy, he pulls a Robotnik and runs away to a giant freaking mech. I'm not being so hyperbole, that's literally what they call it in the game. 
<laughs> Anyways, heck yes, this is a classic boss fight right here. Best of all, every stage of the boss is checkpointed, so you don't have to start from the beginning every time you die. Congratulations, Mayhem Triple. You managed to do something that an inexplicable number of big budget games still can't wrap their heads around. Anyway, this mech is effectively invulnerable to your weapons, so you have to dodge his one-hit kill laser and machine gun and stompy robot legs as you use the walking bombs to set up a trap and drop him down a pit. And Dustin Gunn actually went to enough trouble to program the bunny leader to be smart enough not to just walk into the open pit. You have to actually trick him into standing on top of it before opening it. But that's still barely enough to even damage him, so you gotta fall him down to the pit and do another trap. This time we get lucky and it slices off his laser cannon, so oh yeah, now we get to use the final boss's own weapon. Another video gaming trope that just makes me do the Mamma Mia hands every time it happens. Mwah. So with three satisfying charge shots from his own laser, you blast the bunny out of his mech and leave him bleeding in a crumpled heap. But your victory is cut short with his pain gloating. Even though you've killed him, the rabbits have already defeated the Earth's military and conquered the planet simply by virtue of the fact that they breed faster than we can kill them off. Yeah, all this time you probably thought that the giant bunny thing was just the game being wacky, didn't you? Nope, turns out literally breeding up rabbits is the ultimate weapon, and it's the one thing that even Mick Carter couldn't stop. At least, Mick Carter couldn't stop it. This time. That's right, your one final last gasp attempt at saving the Earth and the human race is to chase down the one time machine in existence as the ship crumbles around you, and try to use it to go back before this all started and do it again. This game doesn't just do New Game Plus, the entire conceit of the game is that you're going to be playing through it multiple times to try and figure out a way to finally get one over on those bunnies. I'll talk more about the time loop mechanic when we get to that, but just it's so good and it elevates what was already a good game into something that's even more memorable, and best of all, it gives you a perfect excuse to replay the game. Oh, and since the head bunny is dead now, you get to use his freaking mech. Stomping and blasting your way through the last swarms of enemies with ease and comfort as the ship crumbles and alarms sound, at least until the entire thing splits in half, sucking the bunny with the time machine out into the upper atmosphere with Mig diving after him in hot pursuit without a moment of hesitation. I love this game! So yeah, one final new mechanic, free falling. You have to make it to the time machine and activate it before you plummet to your death and all the while bunnies are trying to score pot shots on you even as they hurl their own imminent demise. It's so hype. And when you finally catch up to it and vanish in a crackle of static. <sighs> Ooh, uh, give me a sec here. I, I need a bit to calm back down. And there's still one last joke as a capstone to this whole adventure, that the truck that ran over the time traveler at the beginning of the game was actually driven by him, and the trauma of accidentally killing someone combined with the bunny invasion meant he was willing to use the time machine to travel back in time to warn himself. I always love a good ironic closed time loop. So yeah, this game has hidden depths, so of course I immediately went to load my save file and continue because I wanted more, and I was curious to see how things would change. I have to admit, there aren't that many actual changes to the parts of the game that you just played. The creator says that there's enough new content for up to five different loops, but it's mostly just different dialogue from characters. Luckily for you, I am a consummate professional, so I went to the trouble of playing through this game five whole times and recording all the variations so you'll get to see them as we go through this new game plus section. When you pull up your save file, you'll notice it's very helpfully labeled Loop 2. When you load it, you'll get a familiar opening scene, but this time future Mick Carter comes crashing through the ceiling and splats his old self into a fine red mist. Yep, he just loopered himself by accident. It starts off traumatizing, but after a couple loops, he comes to take in stride. Our poor traumatized truck driver doesn't fare much better this time, sadly. Largely due to Mig either forgetting about him or just not caring. If you pick up the radio again, then Mig gets sarcastic and frustrated about having to be told the basic controls all over again, but luckily you can also just jump over it. When the bunny invasion starts, we get our first sign that things are going to be different now because the dang Alpha Bunny comes charging out of the wreckage of the first ship. I actually died to it a couple times before remembering that I still had the final boss's laser cannon and was delighted to find out that it one shot what was once a formidable boss. Also that killing the Alpha Bunny makes it drop one of those upgrade keys so you can start earning those upgrades without worrying about rescuing hostages as much. 
Unfortunately, that single change is about the biggest actual gameplay difference we'll get. I would have dug more variation in enemies on loops or more times when it would play with your expectations like that, but at the same time, I get that that would be a lot of work for something that most players probably would even encounter. Luckily, the core gameplay is so fun and so satisfying that just having an excuse to play through the game again is really all I needed to be happy to do it. And getting to play through with all your weapons and upgrades carried over means those tricky first areas are a cakewalk now. It feels so nice to steamroll a section that had previously killed you so many times and have so much health that you don't even have to worry about managing healing items or dodge rolling everywhere and can just blast away bunnies. My first playthrough may have taken me over an hour, but subsequent ones became a breezy half hour to 40 minutes or so because of this. Especially after I bought all the upgrades and weapons and money didn't really matter anymore, so in the later loops I could just run past the enemies like some kind of speedrunner. Hector Graves takes you being in a time loop in stride and wishes you good luck, sparing you any tutorializing. Since you haven't seen him since before entering the Bunny Mothership, you've got tons of cash saved up, so you're probably going to max out your health and inventory and have enough cash left over to snap up any weapons you didn't buy or find on your first run. Also, one really handy feature is that once you've possessed a weapon, you can always buy another copy of it from Hector Graves for a piddling $100. So if you lose that cool mech laser, you could just get another one from him without having to wait for the final boss. Speaking of, I can show off the weapons I didn't grab last time. Uh, the Face Trapper is a gun that shoots bear traps, which is multifunctional because the bear traps damage enemies directly, but they can also be fired out of the ground and act as, well, traps if an enemy walks over them. The Grenade Launcher is just a grenade launcher, it's actually weirdly underpowered and I never used it that much, and no, you can't use it to free hostages, sadly. The Assault Rifle isn't particularly unique or interesting, but it's probably the best all-around weapon in the game. It's powerful, it fires quickly, and is loud. And the Flamethrower is fun and looks great, just hold down the fire button and everything in front of you turns to ash. That mech laser being a one-hit kill also makes the giant bunny battle a snap on future playthroughs. You never do learn anything more about the mysterious unnamed butt kicker who only gets the one scene. The only difference from the first loop to subsequent playthroughs is Mig just acknowledging the game will never tell him who that guy is supposed to be. Again, my bets are it was an IRL friend of the dev or a cameo from another game dev. When the only woman in the entire game shows up, this time Mig realizes he never got her name. He learns that her name is Georgia Close and decides he's going to try and pull a Groundhog Day and use his time looping to refine his attempts at getting her phone number so he can date her when this is all over. On the next loop, he tries to go for Macho Bravado and is shot down. After that, he finally succeeds by using the fact that he knows her name before they've met to uh, gaslight her into thinking that they went to high school together and he's always had a crush on her. Oh boy. Look, I know this is a silly action game and Mig Carr is supposed to be a hilarious dumbass rather than a role model, but given how much thought goes to the rest of the game, it is kind of disappointing that that's all they do with Georgia. And this is an older game, but it came out the same year that Tropes vs. Women in Video Games debuted, so it's not like this wasn't already an ongoing part of the discussion back then. I feel like if they had to go with the getting a date thing, they could have at least been funnier with it instead just made like a running gag where Mig never succeeds and just keeps getting shot down each time. Oh, well, at least having an explicitly Latinx protagonist was ahead of the curve, so that balances things out, right? Right? That's how these things work. Unfortunately, you can't use your knowledge of the future to stop the bunny from hijacking the helicopter or the penis drones killing that civilian. You're just helpless to watch it play out over and over every time you go through the loop. More missed opportunities, in my humble opinion. One thing that does drag on replays are the bomb escort puzzles. They don't change, so you're just doing the same task each time, and especially as the better weapons make you blast through the combat parts faster than ever, it feels like a larger and larger amount of each playthrough is just hurting these little bombs around. It's also one of the only places where you'll still regularly die, not because of the enemies, but because of the insta-death lasers all over the place. I feel like it was a real missed opportunity to not let you unlock a weapon on replays that had the same properties as those bombs so you could just shoot the switches and move on. Anyways, you finally get to the leader of the giant space bunnies, and your laser cannon means you can just kill him from the get-go, no traps required. He still gives you the same speech, the world's still doomed, your only option is to grab the time machine and try it again, because, oh yeah, you didn't actually do anything different this time. I haven't been showing much of Hector Graves until now because he's ultimately the key to everything. He drops hints, but eventually just comes out and says it. If bunnies are winning because they're rapid breeding, you need to turn that against them. And luckily for you, his shadowy Illuminati organization has a secret lab hidden to the west in the desert, where 30 years ago they developed a virus for the government. A sexually transmitted virus. 
So, yeah, we're gonna save the world by giving the giant space bunnies AIDS. Remember how we said that the lab was to the west? Well, next time you start a new loop, when you leave your house, instead of going to the right, you go to the left. Yep, this has been here the entire time. Granted, you probably wouldn't know that the rubble is destructible on your first try, but still, wowzers. Games where you return to the starting area at the end with new knowledge or abilities that completely transforms the experience is almost always going to be a home run for me, and this is no exception. Again, just doing the Mamma Mia hands. Heading to the left, you find the overgrown secret facility, and interacting with the little Illuminati pyramid in the fountain up front is all it takes to open it up. Once you're inside, an automated system advises you that you have arrived at a weapons testing facility and will be whisked along on this self-guided tour, showing off all the weapons they have for sale. In addition to being an excuse for some fun combat arenas, it also gives you one last chance to pick up any weapons you may have missed. Also, after each floor, you have the option of taking the emergency exit, which whisks you back to the surface, but locks you out of the building for the rest of your playthrough. After fighting through five floors, you finally reach the lowest level and receive the ultimate weapon that you came here for, the Hyper Ejector V, a gun that rapid fires syringes full of AIDS. You're also given a demonstration of what infected rabbits look like. Ugh. There is one last wrinkle that isn't explained very well, but makes sense when you think about it. In order for the virus to take hold, you need to shoot rabbits with it, but not kill them since if they're dead, they can't, well, breed and pass it on. So taking advantage of their easy early levels, you just run through spraying needles and everything that moves, but not actually killing anyone. And if you do it right, then in the next area, the bunnies just start appearing infected. Oh, and uh, when you kill the infected bunnies, they come back as zombies. That's right. Giant, time-traveling, space, bunny, zombies, with AIDS. Okay, now this is epic. Also, when you encounter Hector on this loop, he congratulates you on the genocide, just really making sure you get how fucked up what you're doing is. Anyways, playthrough is normal, and this time when you get to the end, the leader of the Space Bunnies is outraged. His people are dying off en masse, and the invasion has not only failed, but they're being, well, genocided. Of course, he's not going down without a fight, so one final mech battle later, and Mig is triumphant. Or is he? Uh, like the bunny leader says, you may have defeated him, but in doing so you've become a monster yourself. And really, doesn't that make you the loser in the grand scheme of things? One final sprint towards the finish line, this time catching a parachute instead of a time machine. The credits roll and we're congratulated for saving humanity through a combination of time travel, biological warfare, and war crimes. We see Mig Carter floating down to a rescued Earth, landing beside the time machine. And I'll just let what happens after that speak for itself, because I can't think of a better end of the game, or this video.